calling the idiot. <laughs> it's not that we're calling someone an idiot, although, hey, if the shoe fits, I don't know what to say. But what we're doing is we're comparing it to the idiot's guide to knowledge, the idiot's guide to the Bible, the idiot's guide to this, that, or the other thing, because that was a popular series at one time, and it kind of had this guy that looked like with the weird hair and kind of like little explanations and tried to break it up into making it understandable. So in Educating the Idiot, what we're doing is we're discussing the 38 uh, dishonest tricks of argument, ways in which you're being manipulated every day of your life. Now you may not realize it, but in reality, in every relationship, in every situation, because we're in information age, whether you're watching TV, whether you're hearing it on the radio, whether you're talking to your spouse, whether you're uh, listening to someone else, appreciating what they're discussing, or whatever it is that you're dealing with, you're going to find that you're being manipulated by fallacies. Because one of the things that people often do in fallacies is that they will take some portion of scripture and they will, in religious context, use it in order to prove their point. And they don't take the volume of scripture, they'll take a portion of it. They don't have that capability of presenting it just and letting it read for itself. So, in Dishonest Tricks of Argument, we've been going through that, and I wanted to use an example of that in the religious abstraction, because that's what a lot of times people do, is they will abstract from the truth and present a religious argument instead, trying to convince you of something that's not true. It's not accurate. In other words, it's not the truth. Because Jesus said he was the truth. So when we went through it, we were discussing emotional language, faulty distribution, invalid sampling, reduc reductio ad absurdum, and evasion of truth. But I wanted to give you an example, so that way, you know, before we get into the next five mentionings of what those fallacies are, and then get into the real depth of, you know, breaking it down into individual scriptures and then lining it all the way out, I wanted to go ahead and kind of give you an example of one that's popular today that people are using that disproving and approving, you can examine for yourself whether or not you can see these fallacies being done to you or whether you're just being kind of like led astray with some of the things that you haven't really thought through because in argument, it's all about winning the argument. And most people, when you find it in politics, in conversation, in communication, in business, in radio, in television, in texting. It's all about people promoting something. And so let's go ahead and look at this for a minute. We call this uh, formal fallacy. It's one of the five that we'll be looking at next time, but I just wanted to bring it up. And by the way, one of the words that I was thinking of that when we were talking about emotional language was the uh, collateral damage. Was that when we were talking about fallacy, the military likes to use terminologies with which to make neutral something you don't think about when we use that term collateral damage. Because, see, here's what happens, is that right now, you may not think that's very important. Oh, it's collateral damage, you know? Those guys that were like in Pakistan that had the drone attack recently, you know, how the building got blown up and, you know, the Al-Qaeda operative got killed and everybody went, yeah, oh boy. And then there was also mentioned real small collateral damage Three people died. Well, that doesn't sound too important. You know, it's collateral damage. We got who we were going after. We took a drone, we flew into somebody else's country, we overflew into somebody else's country in order to get somebody we wanted to kill because we didn't want them to kill us, so kill or be killed. I mean, now, remember, we are Christians here. We're talking Christian to Christian, so let's be real. We're going out to kill someone before they kill us, so it's kill or be killed. I see. <laughs> Interesting concept, huh? So we go ahead and take this drone, and we go ahead and blow up this building, and it just so happens that the three people that got killed were a father, a mother, and a child. And, yeah, you know, that doesn't sound too bad. You know, it's collateral damage. We got the Al-Qaeda operative. Thousands of other people would have died if he would have lived because, after all, he was the bad guy, you know, and we got to get the bad guy because we're the good guys. Now, Using that term collateral damage is what we call a fallacy because what it does is that it makes you feel good about what was accomplished. Because you see, if I went ahead and said to you, well, here's what happened in the news. Flash, news flash. A drone attack by Al-Qaeda came into America and 
attacked on foreign on American soil one of our own and our own general was killed along with his mother and father and child and we would say that's not right we need to go get them you see you could reverse the situation and somehow it doesn't sound right when it's done to us but it's okay to do it to someone else but wait a minute they were terrorists and we're not well terrorism also is kind of like that word that we used and we explained how one man's terrorism is another man's patriotism so you kind of get kind of mixture of terminologies being used for fallacy because the argument isn't presented to you accurately. So now let's take a look at that collateral damage for a minute just to explain it so you understand the emotional language. When I say to you collateral damage, it doesn't sound so bad. Now if I said your mother, your father, and your child who was visiting as grandparents, you know, they had taken your child, over to Pakistan and they got in a cab and they were driving by over to Kabul well actually that's in the wrong country but you wouldn't know that they were driving over to another place and they happened to go by this building right at the same time that the drone attacked that building and blew it up oh my god that's your mother your father and your child holy cow that's devastating that's horrendous that's 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 not right. Oh, wait a minute. It's okay. It's collateral damage. Do you see something interesting there? When we call it collateral damage, you don't think about it. But if I told you that it's somebody's mother and father and child that died, then it's like, oh my God. Or better yet, if I said to you something completely different, if I went ahead and spoke to you and said, hey, do you realize that in Israel that there's collateral damage, Jews are dying, and the way Americans are right now with getting all excited about Israel, oh no, we got to do something. Collateral damage is happening. But you see, we don't treat maybe Islamic or Muslim people the same way we treat Jews, do we? We don't treat people in Pakistan the same way we treat people in Israel, do we? We don't treat life the same way the Bible says to like we should, do we? Because we've been all brainwashed by fallacies. We've all been hardened of heart by the way we're using words and terminology in order to make us conditioned and programmed to not be abhorred by innocent lives killed. So that's part of what we're doing in examining the fallacy and why we're applying it to Scripture because we want you to understand where we're coming from and what some fallacies will do to affect you in hardening your heart. Now let's look at one that will affect you spiritually that will deceive you into believing a lie because this is how it works in formal fallacies. We call it a... I don't know if the light's still shining on it so if you can't see it, you know, it's kind of bright maybe down here reflecting it. I'm not sure. But A plus B equals C. That's kind of what formal fallacy is. It says, let me give you what A is and then let me give you what B is and then I want to tell you what that means. So I'll give you C. So A is going to be a proof that we can say God is love. And we all agree. God is love. Well, of course God is love. God is love. God loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Right? God is love. And we know that we can agree to this because God is love and we know that it's a scripture, right? So we all agree, point A, the first statement that comes out, wow, yeah, God is love, that's right, I agree. So I say, well, okay, good, I'm glad, you know, we're on the same page, you know, and now that you're starting to agree, let me keep you in that agreeable mindset. See how that's beginning to work already? You're agreeable and you're agreeing. You're not questioning, you're agreeing. So let's go to B. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in should not perish but have everlasting life. So we know that A, God is love, right? Yeah, of course he is. And B, God so loved the world. Yeah, God loves the world. That's cool, we agree. God is love, God so loved the world. Man, you know, we're on the same page, really, are we? So since God loves the world, and God is love, 
God will not send anyone to hell because God loves them. Right? God doesn't pour out his wrath on someone he loves. He only pours out his wrath on someone he hates. So, would God send someone to hell? Will God send someone to eternal torment? Now, I don't know about you, but for me, as soon as I read number three, C, I start looking back and saying, now how do we get to this place? Because he said God is love, and I'm going, well, yeah, that's true, and God so loved the world, well, yeah, that's true. But how did he get to where God will not send anyone to hell because God loves them? Do you see how you were led? God is love, God loves the world, and God loves them. A plus B equals C. Now let me show you something interesting about that. Here's the way that it works in math. Because A plus B equals C, and C is not accurate because A is a scripture, correct? Yes, I'm glad you agree. B is a scripture, correct? Yes, I'm glad you agree. C is a conclusion. It's not a scripture. It's something that's been interpreted by based upon two scriptures. Some people would say out of context, but we'll just say, for the sake of argument in this religious abstraction, let's just go with it and say these were the only two scriptures you had in the entire Bible. So would you come up with the conclusion that God will not send anyone to hell because he loves them? Ah, watch this. Because C is not a scripture, that means the equation is not equal. So that means we have to do something about this in order for it to be equal. A plus B equals C, and since this is a scripture, and this is a scripture, and this is not a scripture, we have to take C out of the equation in order for it to be balanced, because we have A plus B, and it has to balance. So what we do is we put A plus C, and then we put over here in the equation, if we were lining it out, we would go A, S, plus B, S equals C and S, and then to get it out of the equation, we would bring it down to N S over C equals A S plus B S over C and S. Now this is math, so I'm, I'm sure that you all love geometry and you all love algebra and you all love these word problems and you all love you know theoretical mathematical equations. So in order to make this equation work out, we had to reverse this and put it on the opposite side because we know by mathematical laws we can do that. In logic, the same way it works. It's all logical. You get it? So I've taken C and S, which is your C right here. God will not send anyone to hell. And I've called it a non-scripture because it doesn't equal these. We already know that. So in order to make it equal these, we have to flip it over so that it can cancel each other out. So here's what happens, the beauty of it. And this is kind of tricky, but it's the way it works in math. Because this is flipped over on this side, we know we can eliminate this and eliminate this. And you wind up with, see these are A, S over B, S would be on this side, then it would be on that side also because they're equal. So if we made that equation right, then it would be AS plus BS equals AS plus BS. And I don't mean BS like in what you're thinking. So the reality is, is that A plus B equals C is not true. It's tricky, but here's what the truth is. And it led me to my way of examining all scriptures. And this is how you examine fallacy in math or in logic. You would go A plus B equals A plus B. In other words, there is no C because it's not a scripture. So you take it out completely. That's what the reality of the truth is. The fallacy is to say A plus B equals C. That's not true. It's not equal and you already were shown why. Because it's not a scripture, is it? Oh, so the conclusion, and they're trying to make you think that it's a proof. Proofs are equal to what they're proof and demonstrating. The Bible says what it means, it means what it says. Yes, God is love. We know that. Yes, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yes, God will send people to hell because of what we know about the scripture. But that doesn't mean that he sends people to hell 
outside of saying God will not send anyone because it's not what he said. He himself gave scriptures for his own answer. So the answer to this fallacy, whenever you have a religious abstraction, is that scripture answers scripture. That's how you make the equation equal. If you start with A plus B, your conclusion has to be a scripture. It can't be a conclusion based upon scriptures. That's fallacy. It's leading you down a way where it's making you think the wrong way of communicating. You use numbers to communicate numbers, in other words. Kind of like when we say 1 plus 1 equals 2. You wouldn't say 1 plus A equals 2, would you? Because the A is not a number. That's what we're saying about these scriptures. You don't go this plus this, which are two scriptures, equals a non-scripture. It doesn't work that way. You get it? Fallacy. So, I wanted to give you this example because it's relevant in our life today. There are people that actually are using this kind of logic to prove that God would never send anyone to hell. That God is going to put them into purgatory for a while and let them get cleaned up. Or God is going to bring everyone into heaven eventually. Just in his own time, in his own way. Because they use this logic of God will not appoint someone to wrath. He will not torment someone, so he doesn't pour out his wrath upon the church. That's what they say. You see, I'm sure you've heard that scripture before because it's used about the rapture. So you see, on the one hand, there could be a cult out there, which there is, a very big cult, Church of God, and it comes from Armstrongism, and they're very big now, and they're pushing it. They're really huge in Canada. But they're pushing this whole idea, and now John Bell's in on it, and kind of doing a humanistic version of it, where there's no hell. God's not going to send you to hell. God isn't going to appoint to you for wrath. God wouldn't appoint for you eternal punishment. No, no, no. no. See, see, that was reserved for the angels, and God's not going to send you there. He's going to kind of like, you know, work it out where he's going to, because he loves you, he's going to take care of it and fix it. But they make it into a big presentation, which boils down to, if you get rid of all the fluff, A plus B equals C. They're lying. They're deceiving you. They're using a form of logic, which is called sophistry, but they're using a form of argument to present a case that's not true. And it is knocking the socks off of people who have no idea what logic is. They have no idea what mathematical equations are. They have no idea what differentiation of application of scriptures are. So they don't see it coming because they have a blind spot. Now, you would say, well, I know there's a hell. And I know that there are people going to hell. Well, good. So you don't have a blind spot there. Let me show you where your blind spot is. Because like I told you, everyone is being affected by fallacies today. And they're doing it in religious abstractions by abstracting some portion of scripture in order to make a case for something that's not true and using fallacy to prove it. I don't know if you're ready for this, but we'll try to see if you could graduate with this example to step two. Personal. Your blind spot. Because I'm sure that you're not one of those people that don't believe in hell because you know Jesus taught on it and you know all the other parts to prove it. I think. So let's go with wrath. It's said that God has not appointed the church to wrath. So obviously everyone isn't going to hell, but everyone is going in the rapture, right? Or are they? You see, the same logic that people are using to say that God has not appointed the church to wrath is the same logic where people are trying to say, well, everybody's going in the rapture because two shall be taken and one shall be left. Wait a minute. Two shall be taken, one left. You thought I was going to flip you off, didn't you? I didn't. Two shall be taken, one left. Two, one, two, one, two, one, two. I thought two is two, and one is one. So, how do we get to everyone's going in a rapture when they're using God is not going to rapture, so everybody gets to go? And it's a promise to those that just believe in the rapture, so we get to go. <laughs> really? Do you think maybe there's a formal fallacy going on here about 
God has not appointed the church to wrath so that everybody gets to go? What did Jesus say? Hmm. Two shall be taken, two shall be in the field, one shall be taken the other left. Two would be walking on the road, one shall be taken the other left. Oh, he didn't mean like in the twinkle of an eye for those people. He didn't mean that. Well, wait a minute, that is a rapture reference, isn't it? Or is it? Now, I believe it's a rapture reference because it's always been taught that way. But you see, whenever they're using this to prove this, I agree. God has not appointed the church to wrath. That's A. That's a scripture. B. There is a rapture. Because I can find it in the book of Revelation where it says that, you know, they would be spared from the hour of temptation that's to come upon the whole world. Or that I could find it, you know, that, you know, that uh, I don't necessarily believe in the 1 Thessalonians 4.16 or whichever one it was that in 1 Thessalonians or 2 Thessalonians where it's the rapture one. Because I keep thinking, that doesn't sound right. But there are enough other references in scripture that I believe in the pre trib rapture. I do believe that God is coming and God is going to take some rapidly out of harm's way and take them into heaven. Now, it's interesting that we can quote the wrath of God. God is not appointing church wrath. We can quote a scripture for the rapture, you know, and we've got a very... Um, but can you quote a scripture for everyone goes in the rapture? You see, everyone going... Everyone goes. You see, it's not a scripture. Oops! You should be thinking, really? I thought it was a scripture. They always present it like a scripture. Yeah, they do, don't they? Kind of like these guys did with religious abstraction. Formal fallacy. Presenting a plus B equals C. Because people in prophecy want to get you excited about prophecy. People that are pastors want you to look for the Lord's coming because that's one of the doctrines or it might be a dogma. That's one of the things we're supposed to do. But I could just as easily tell you you don't need to look for the Lord's coming in order to be expecting Him. You could die today. So you better be looking for the Lord's coming because He could come and take you home by you dying from natural causes or from a car hitting you or anything else. So I could use that to also say no man knoweth the day or the hour. Now I'm not trying to discredit the rapture. I'm just trying to tell you that is a factual way to make you aware that your time is short. You don't know when you die. You don't know how much time you have left. Better take care of it. Better be ready. Right? People get ready. The death is coming. Or on the imminency of his return Yes, we should be looking for the Lord's return because Israel became a nation. There are reasons why we look for his return. Wrath isn't one of them and rapture isn't one of them. We don't look for an escape route and that's why people have been deceived by fallacy, a formal fallacy, into thinking they're going in the rapture when God has given a criteria of some type. We don't know what type because we haven't explained it here and I'm not going to get into it without giving you scripture, so I'm just going to simply say, we've been given a bill of goods, A plus B equals C, so that you are one of the chosen, one of the special, one of those who's going, yes, I'm going, I'm going, I know that I am going, because after all, the parable of the ten virgins are about everybody looking for the Lord's return and only five were ready. Oh, wait a minute, that doesn't involve the rapture because those people that talk about wrath like to say, that's not really about the rapture. You can't use that one scripture, you know, to apply only five get to go, you know, or 50%. You can't use that because, just because it matches two walking in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. Just because it matches that doesn't mean it applies to the rapture. So you see, we all have blind spots. <laughs> and whatever your favorite idea, if you haven't proven it to yourself, 
if you haven't taken the time to talk to God about it, I tell you, I could sell you a house and a home and a mortgage and get you all prepared for the Lord's return because you know what? There's a king's highway and he's going to take everybody straight up it because wide is the way and all kinds of people are going to go on that day. Everybody that believes in the rapture and looking for his return, by golly, they get to go because that parable ten virgins doesn't have anything to do with the rapture. Where does it? It's your cigar. Smoke it. If you think that it's not a fallacy, show me. <laughs> because one of the things that's going to happen in this study down the road when we get into all the examples, not just this Educating the Idiot series, but when we get into the formal teaching on fallacy, when we really start putting out one scripture and look and see how everybody has been making this into proof for this and proof for that and using this and using that and saying this and saying that, you're going to drop your jaw and go, I used to believe that. It's kind of like the one that says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Used for evangelism when it never was intended. It's used for Christians that are already saved. Interesting, isn't it? Fallacies. That's why we have denominations. That's why we have explanations. That's why we have interpretations. That's why we have theologies. That's why we have all these people separating themselves along weird lines because some people know what a fallacy is. They know what an ad hominem attack is. They know what distraction is. They know what emotional language is. They know how to use certain terms in order to convince you to come on with us. Because you see, if they don't get followers, and a lot of people don't follow their idea, nobody would be there. We'd all be unified in one body of Christ. We'd all be together in one, hopefully, body looking for the Lord's return and enjoying that expectation that Jesus is coming for his beautiful bride because we all believe in grace, mercy, and love. And we all pray to be counted worthy because we've prepared ourselves. We been anointed and appointed and directed that God is going to take us with him when he returns. Because the spirit is going to leave and we're going to be sucked along with him. Hmm. Maybe this study of fallacy has a personal application for you. Maybe when we get done with educating the idiot about all these dishonest tricks of argument that's been presented from Hebrew for Christians, you know, on their website and it's actually from a formal book of uh, Straight and Crooked Thinking by Robert Dulles. That, uh, and then the argumentation and fallacy and sophistry is a formal education process that you go through when you go to universities because logic isn't taught in elementary schools and it isn't taught in high school and isn't taught in junior high. But guess where it is taught in other countries? Guess where it is taught in a different culture? In the Jewish culture, fallacy and logic is taught as part of our education. It is a process of arranging our mind in order to understand people and to be able to be aware when we're being deceived. So, a lot of people around you, they might be using these things on you because like I said from the beginning, everyone has a blind spot. Everyone is being misled by fallacies, everyone is using this on you in some way, shape, or form because you live in a world that's sending you, giving you, pushing on you, and making you deal with information without thinking. You probably have never really taken a sentence apart and realized that there's a you know, the adjective and the subject and the noun and the verb and they all go off into lines, you know, because you didn't go for an English major, you know, they don't teach that in school anymore. Or that you don't understand this whole idea of mathematical equations or equational analysis of putting together the terminology and the words into something that you can work out as a solution in math and then apply it back to the actual reality of life. It's kind of like Einstein stuff, you know. <laughs> or probability factors, you know, when it comes to prophecy, how can we have people out there saying things that are like 
oh yeah, it's going to be a Muslim Antichrist, you know. And the probability factor is like, eh, oh, but, 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 but I got a scripture to prove it. Yeah, really? How many? Huh. Okay, so you got two and I got ten. Uh, you know, that just doesn't work out for me. In other words, you need to kind of like begin to think because that's what this is all about. Educating the idiot, really, is the person who doesn't think. And I'm not calling you an idiot. I'm not telling you you are educated. I'm just saying, if you're not thinking, then we are here to educate the idiot. And I don't know if you're one of those idiots or not that isn't thinking. Because if you're a fool and a folly, then you're going to fall in the pit that you dug by not preparing yourself with your mind, by not ordering your conversation and understanding the times that we live in, and that not being aware of even deceiving ourselves into believing something, which is one of the, by the way, one of the forms of fallacy is to deceive ourselves because it's like a, called a, what is it? Lesser of two evils? No, that's not it. The true believer. Suggestion by repeated affirmation. What? Hmm. You mean if somebody keeps repeating it over and over again, I'm going to be brainwashed into believing it? Hitler proved it. He was one of the first ones that most people in the public started quoting and said, if you say something over and over again, loud enough, long enough, and yelled it, forceful enough, people start to believe it. And that's pretty sad when a nation went that way. So, this isn't just about a teaching on the news because you have your pros and cons when you think Republican or Democrat. You have your pro of liberal and conservative. I'm telling you, everybody's doing it. Everybody from the high to the low, from the middle to the side. They just weren't trained to be able to protect their ears to hear what's being said, to arrange their conversation so that they know how to articulate what's being done to them in order to express what you believe in. Because that's what's happening. People who do know how are misleading you. And I can tell you, it is a very, very eye-opening experience when you finally get a handle on it and you can say, and the first time it clicks for you, it will automatically open up your wisdom factor exponentially and you'll become I'm a genius. <laughs> no, you're not a genius, but the Holy Spirit opened up the doors. For you to understand, to be able to see how people are doing it to you in your texting even, in your Facebook comments, in just the posts, in the little lines on those videos on top, and you don't realize what they're saying because you saw a nice picture. You went for the picture, but you swallowed the poison. Yeah, right. They misspelled that word by accident. No, they didn't. Oh, you mean I gotta pay attention? You mean I have to watch and get ready and to be prepared for the coming of the Lord is at hand? And we know that Satan is out there to do his job. And we know that people are out there doing fallacies. So maybe we should educate the idiot so that he would know these things and prove all things and hold fast that which is good. Not just proving it, but learning how to think for themselves. Because I'm gonna tell you this. You can go to God and ask God, and God will speak to you. If you have that kind of relationship, which I do, you know, I'll ask God, and God will make me either think about it, or he'll tell me what it is, or he'll give me enough to make me think about it, and then I'll consider it, and then I'll come back to him with another question, and I'll come back to him, and I'll keep coming back to him until I get the answer. But I'm telling you this. God intended for you to be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is the perfect sub you have to renew your mind. You have to learn some logic. You have to learn how to examine the scripture. You have to learn how to rightly divide the word of truth. Logic, right now, that I'm teaching you in the negative sense of the fallacies, is rightly dividing what's being brainwashed on you. You're dividing it up into what the basic denominators are so that you know if you're being brainwashed, misled, propaganda, or truth. Sure, A and B are true, but C would have killed you, and you'd have wound up in hell. So you see how serious the subject can get? I'm trying to make it real for you in the example, so that way you know this isn't just an intellectual assertion. This isn't just trying to make you some kind of educated intelligentsia. No, this is something that's happening to you 
right now, and it isn't President Obama doing it. It is everyone doing it all around you all the time. Jesus gave us a better way. And at the end of this Educating the Idiot series, which is, I believe, six of them, and then some examples, which will probably be six or seven of them, then we're going to go into formal fallacy and informal fallacy, the complete study. And it's kind of long, you know, but we're going to give examples and it'll be an education process. But when we get done with educating the idiot and fallacies and informal fallacies, then we're going to do the positive side. How to make equational analysis of the scriptures. How to prove truth in the Bible, how to ask God intelligent questions, how to have, and this is what I like to call it, and it will probably be the name of the series, intelligent faith. Because you see, faith isn't saying, well, I just have to believe God and that's all there is to it. No, that's baloney. You know, God will leave you alone to your own stupidity. He really will. I mean, you can tell God that, God, you know, I believe that, you know, in the name of Jesus, I can have this and I can do it and I can get it. And God will say, sure, go ahead and have it. You know, it's stupid because I would have given you something better and then this is going to hurt you. But you know what? If you really want it and you want to keep pushing it, good. I'll let you go and go do your thing. Because the bottom line in fallacies, in wrath, in rapture, in all that's being done is one simple two-word statement that people don't want to hear. God's will. God's will. What is God's will for you? What is God's will in every given situation and circumstance? Is it God's will that you should be deceived? No. But will you be? If you deceive yourself, sure. Because God's will was that you should be educated. And that's why I'm here. I'm not here because I enjoy doing this. As a matter of fact, I kind of look around and go, you're kidding me. You mean you don't know? You don't realize that's how you got there, where you're at? You did it? They did it to you, but you didn't think it through? You didn't take a look at that video you passed on to someone else? You didn't examine the words that were in that paragraph or that structure that you just said to someone? Really? You went ahead and bought it hook, line, and sinker? Just like that? Maybe you need to get some oil. Maybe, like the wise virgins, you are only half full and the rest of us are full. Maybe it's time to get some oil and not be burning up your oil on fallacies, but filling your lantern with truth and the spirit of truth. So I hope you've got blessed by this study in some way. And I hope that you understand that when you want to know something, you can Google it. You can find the facts on Google. You're going to find everything else too, but you don't need to just listen to one person make a statement to you and then go, oh yeah, I accept that. No, you should go prove it. Go find some more facts. Go prove it by getting together with a lot of information and then evaluate that information by way of not just an A plus B equals C. Go through the alphabet. It better all fit perfectly into an easy understood picture for you to understand on a simple level with all of the scriptures applied. Or guess what? If they don't all apply, then none of them apply because it's a fallacy. That's your rule of thumb. Either all of them that are related to that subject fit, or none of them do. You don't get to pick and choose. God's perfect in that way. It's a fallacy when they're picking them for you, and you don't find out until later that there were some extra pieces missing. So this should be Alpha through Omega, Aleph through Tav, to make a complete picture that fits with what Jesus said. And that will be the answer for you on fallacies every time.